Welcome to the Texas York Wright podcast. I am your grand chaplain for the Grand Council of Texas, Jim Rumsey. We have with us this evening, uh, Billy Jack Hamilton, who is the current thrice illustrious master of Texas Council number 321 in Fort Worth. He's also the chairman of the internet committee for the Grand Council. We have with us Chance Chapman, the Grand Conductor of the Grand Council, and he is still the excellent Grand Senior Warden of the Grand Commandery of Knights Templar of Texas. He's still that guy. And we have a special guest with us tonight. He's, he's not really special. He's with us every week, but uh, he's in the hot seat tonight, and that's going to be our most illustrious Grand Master, Don Paul Payton of the most illustrious Grand Council of Royal and Select Masters. So welcome, Grand Master. Oh, it's uh, good to be on the other side of the screen tonight. So we're gonna start off with some uh, discussion questions and I'm gonna call uh, to throw it to Billy first. All right, thank you, Jim. Uh, so this question is one that I've seen brought up a couple of times on the Facebook Freemasonry groups uh, that the, about the impact of social isolation on mental health. Uh, for some companions, lodge and council assembly and so forth, are their only social outlets. Uh, and, you know, during this time, uh, you know, they're isolated a little bit more than the average person. Uh, so my question is, what do you think this COVID virus and the resulting social isolation, do you think that it could have an impact on the mental health of of some of the companions. I'll start this one off. I'm not a mental health professional, uh, so but I can't imagine it not affecting everyone in some capacity in some way, whether we want to admit it or not. Uh, what I'm more worried about uh, is those guys who just completely get out of the habit uh, of going to lodge. The isolation is really getting to them, and it's going to continue because that's their new norm or their new habit is the oscillation. And they're not realizing that it's having an impact on their, on their, on their mental psyche, so to speak. Yeah, I definitely agree with you, Jim. Um, this is becoming the new normal and they don't even realize it. But um, with that, I think we are going to need to be reaching out to our, uh, brothers and companions on their mental health uh, side of things because this is affecting everyone one way or another mentally emotionally physically whatever the case may be um, you know it it's a little strange sitting at home night after night after night after night when you're used to going somewhere at least once a month if not once twice three times a week like some of us um, so a lot of people are bored they're ready to get out but what is it doing to their psyche? I agree. Um, so we, we have to be brothers and companions to them and reach out to them, make sure that they're good and ready to come back and see us and know that we're missing them and ready to see them as well. Well, uh, I know here in Weatherford, uh, several companions, other Masons or not, uh, on a daily basis go out to other guys, other members of our uh, lodges, chapter councils, commandery here in Weatherford and check on them, bring it, if they need bread, milk, whatever, you know, the guys that haven't got out of the house for the last two months, it seems like, uh, and have conversations. But uh, I think uh, with what's going on right now, I actually spend more time on the phone talking to people <laughs> than I, Masons, than I do normally when we're normally going to lodge or, or in a typical day. Uh, I seem to be on the phone a lot more asking certain questions and you know stuff like that, but uh, for sure we need to check on everybody. I agree. All right, excellent. Thank you. Yeah, and for our part at uh, Texas Council, we, we have a phone tree, and so we make it a habit to reach out regularly to the companions to make sure they're doing okay, uh, kind of similar to what you were talking about in Weatherford. And I can't, this is not necessarily council related, but my Blue Lodges are doing regular Zoom meetings just to keep people engaged. 
but that's limited just to the officers primarily and the handful of guys who are the active guys that, that participate. Those other 100 plus guys, they're, they're not being reached. And that, that, that gives me a little bit of concern right now. I don't know how many of y'all are fans of the TV show Parks and Recreation, but uh, I was obsessed with it being a government worker for almost seven years. Uh, it, it shows a funny side to being a government worker. Uh, and they did their COVID-19 special about a week ago, I guess. And that, that was part of the episode every single day. One person called another who called the, the next one and the next one and the next one to do a buddy checkup, basically. And it was kind of interesting to see that happening on a TV show when so many people are uh, implementing it in their lives. And it's something we should probably be looking into uh, for our lodges and chapter council commander, status right, whatever the case may be. Okay, so our next question is, Texas does not belong to the general grand chapter. It does not belong to the general grand council, but we do belong to the grand encampment for uh, commandery. All of us know that. Hopefully our, our viewers know that. We're all very proud of that um, for our chapter and council uh, for different reasons, but there's always pros and cons to everything. So just wondering what everyone's thoughts, what is the biggest pro, what is the biggest con to belonging and not belonging to those national bodies? So uh, General Grand Council in respect to, uh, I do not believe that Texas should be a member of General Grand Council. A couple of reasons. One, uh, after looking at uh, looking it up online, each, uh, each subordinate council shall pay into the treasury of the general grand council $5 for each companion greeted therein $2.50 annually for each member until such time as grand council should be regularly established. Uh, that's a per capita, subordinate council per capita. And then, uh, it says you got to pay two dollars and fifty cents for each cryptic mason, uh, rolls or royal slate master in good standing on the rolls is the date of their annual grand assembly. So if you did the math, I mean you're looking. We do. We've got roughly say seven thousand members right now. Two dollars and fifty cents. Seventeen thousand five hundred dollars right there just to belong to something, uh, and. I don't know, I don't see a benefit. It's a great organization. Hey, some states need stuff like that, but we have, we're pretty proud with what we've created since the 1800s with the Grand Council. Uh, 7,000 members, we have the largest membership of any jurisdiction. We have our own awards. Uh, we have our own uh, charity, uh, which is the Texas Masonic Retirement Center, the sole charity for the Grand Council. So. I just, at this point in time, I don't see any benefit of spending uh, money to belong something just to say we belong. Yeah, and, and you brought up an interesting point with um, saying the smaller jurisdictions might need it. And I think that's the biggest resource for those smaller grand jurisdictions. They don't have everything that they need to function properly. That's where the general grant steps in to help those smaller grand jurisdictions. So I think that's really good for them. Uh, I don't think it would work for our grand chapter and our grand council by any means. Uh, and if, if you don't know why we are not members of it, it is on the grand uh, chapter website, a synopsis of the history. And it's a very interesting read and it makes you uh, look at it in a different way. If you were ever on the, pro let's be a, uh, a part of the general grand chapter side. I'm going to agree with the grand master on the cons, particularly the part that says that we don't see a direct benefit. Uh, the grand body would see the benefit. Uh, we wouldn't see it. Uh, <clears throat> and on a more general note, uh, I just believe that Texas masonically is sovereign and shouldn't become uh, second second to another grand body. We fought hard uh, all the way through our 
national independence and then joining the United States historically from a government perspective, but Masonically, we fought hard to have Freemasonry in Texas to be sovereign. Uh, and York Rock Freemasonry, aside from the commandery, had those same fights. And we have fought hard to have that. I think we, that's important. I think we were doing, I think we would do our, our Masonic forefathers uh, an injustice by bowing to the sovereignty of another grand body. So the question I have actually is, are they really sovereign? Um, so like General, or, well, Grand Encampment, which used to be called General Grand Encampment also back in the 1800s, um, Grand Encampment, if the Grand Master doesn't agree with the Grand Commander, he can remove that Grand Commander. Uh, I'm not sure if the General Grand Master of the Council or the General Grand uh, High Priest of the Chapter has that same authority, and, and that's something I'd have to look into. Um, but if so, then then yeah, that definitely steps all over the sovereignty of of any of the constituent grand bodies under it. Uh, and yeah, there's something that that feels a little weird about that, uh, especially to our Texas sensibilities, right? Because we are so very independent. Um, one thing I I can say that uh, I've been to the South Central Department Conference uh, the past couple of years. I love hanging out with the companions there, right? It's uh, a lot of great guys, a lot of great conversations, but I haven't yet seen something that makes a definitive case for joining the general brand body. I, I don't see a benefit uh, that outweighs the fact that it's it'd be yet another expense that we would have as, as a grand body. Uh, I like some of the elements of the ritual that they have. Uh, so the, the General Grand Council actually has an apron lecture that goes along with the, uh, with the council apron, which is beautiful, it, it's fantastic. Um, some of the uh, Ahasher's parts and some of the, the expanded parts that you see in the Royal and Select Master, uh, those are also found in the General Grand Ritual, uh, General Grand Council Ritual, uh, but I don't think that outweighs uh, what we would lose, right? Um, and, and as mentioned before, they have great programs, but we have similar programs as well. So for me, I, I guess I just don't see a benefit that outweighs the loss of sovereignty and, well, the loss of, of revenue as well. So in Texas, we are very sovereign minded, right? Um, but we have to remember besides our Grand Lodge, our Grand Chapter and our Grand Council, just about every other Masonic organization in Texas does belong to a, a national body, whether it's Grand Encampment, the uh, Supreme Council for Scottish Rite, uh, Imperial Shrine, uh, General Grand Chapter for Eastern Star, uh, all the pendant York Rite bodies are pretty much um, headed up by a national body as well. So we like to think we're very sovereign, um, but on the flip side, most of our organizations do belong to that national body. However, uh, as we witnessed in 2018 in another jurisdiction uh, pretty close to Texas, just because the national body says one thing, doesn't mean that they overrule the grand master of that grand lodge in that jurisdiction. Um, we saw that in 2018, and the grand master of the grand jurisdiction won, uh, for the most part, in that battle, I guess you could say, of who outranks who. So um, while they are sovereign, this goes back to our episode last week, where we or pretty much every week that Jim has brought it up is are these appendant bodies really sovereign or do they all answer to the grand lodge of your grand jurisdiction? Uh, so it's kind of a, a back and forth there. So it's a little uh, contradicting in a way for us to say, Oh yeah, uh, we should belong or we shouldn't belong. Both have their pros, both have their cons. Uh, so it's just interesting to get y'all's perspective on it. Uh, definitely agree that the camaraderie, the fellowship, the friendships, and the charity of the Grand Encampment, especially uh, the Knight Templar Eye Foundation, very important to me. Uh, that is the biggest pro, in my opinion, for belonging to those bodies. 
Um, and of course, the biggest downside is the, the, the expense that we all see across Texas, especially all these local bodies are, are already having a tough time financially. That's just another burden to put on top of them. So yeah, that's a big con. So my question is, aside from the, the charitable aspects of the general grand body, what's the, what would be a, a benefit, if any, to our constituent councils to be a member of general grand council? Is there a benefit? I, I see. I've read, uh, it's been several years ago when Jewel P. Lightfoot, right before he passed away, he wrote a big paper on uh, the pros of general grand chapter of general grand council but i think there was some from what i hear uh there was some other added aspects into that for him uh kind of being in favor of it at that point in time that he might have been elevated in that in the general grand line uh heaven forbid <laughs> i don't know for sure but that's you know you hear different stories what are you saying? okay so piece of random information about jewel p lightfoot uh, you may not know that uh, past Grand Master David DeBrell uh, passed away a couple of years ago, and he had an incomplete paper with Texas Lodge of Research on the history of the Red Cross of Constantine in Texas. Uh, he passed away, and uh, I got permission from both the Lodge and from Mrs. DeBrell to finish that paper on David's behalf and have it presented uh, with David receiving credit for that. Uh, in his paper, he did a lot of research on Jewel P. Lightfoot, who is in the grand line of the grand body for the Red Cross of Constantine at the national level when he died. So Jewel P. Lightfoot, even though he, we see him as a, as a staunch Texas Mason, uh, he wasn't necessarily at the same caliber as, say, Cochran was. Uh, he was more focused on the national stuff than Texas stuff in his later life. So just, just a little piece of tidbit information for you. All right, next discussion question. The Grand Council official logo. Sometimes the triangle points up. Sometimes the triangle points down. What's official and why are there varieties out there? This is a Facebook question, by the way. Billy, you're the one that uh, does most of the artwork, so in, you would know this. So we're going to pass it to you. Here I am being a host. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> honestly, um, I, I've done a lot of research into the uh, Grand Council uh, Constitution and Laws, and it says in there that it should be a trowel enclosed in a broken triangle enclosed in a triangle with the sword going through it. Now, it doesn't say what direction any of those should point in, just that those will be the components of it. It does have a diagram in there, though, as an example. And I think most people just use that diagram as the word, right, of this is how it should be. Um, but when you look at the description, it, it's, it's actually kind of vague. So, Billy, that depiction, you said it's in the law book? It is, yeah. So, so if it's in the law book, that's the official one, right? Uh, well, it is. It, it, I, I look, I've got my <laughs> law book out right here since y'all brought this up. <laughs> so I'm even though the wording is vague, the diagram pictured is in the law book, so that's the right one. So the rebuttal I have for that, though, is if you look at the Grand Council seal. It doesn't have a sword, and the triangles are pointing in the opposite direction as the example for the logo. So but there's a difference in the logo and the seal, right? right. And, and in the law, uh, Article B-043 of the Grand Council uh, is seal and it says the grand recorder shall keep the seal of the grand council and affix same to all dispensations, charters, and other documents proper to be sealed and certified. And it has a copy of the seal, which is on the grand master's ring, and it is also this year on the name badges uh, for the deputies and past grands and all that good stuff. Um, 
and it's on the ties also on the bottom of the ties it has the seal 1855-1907 and uh, I asked that question also and basically it's uh, it's in the law and that's what it is so if you feel like you should change it I guess uh, <laughs> submit a resolution <laughs> there you go so but that's that's for the seal right the logo is different because the logo is, is the trowel and the in the triangle and broken triangle and sword. That's right. So, and there is an example in the Constitution for that too. Hold on now, Billy. All right, here we go. Official emblem, Article B-126. The official emblem of the Grand Council of Royal Lake Masters of Texas is a triangle enclosed a broken triangle, which in turn encloses a trowel and with all it's surmounted by a sword period and then it has a picture of the logo right there of course the way you're looking at it now it's backwards well no i mean don't get me wrong right because um you know working on the imagery i've i've done that but i'm saying if you go by the wording alone uh it, it does leave some room for interpretation Hey, Jim, you know what this sounds like? A, a, a good mission for the History and Preservation Committee to, to nail down. Well, that, that's fantastic, but I'm the chairman of Purposes and Policies. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to make sure I get this straight. The logo in the law book has a downward pointing triangle, but the logo on the seal has an upward pointing triangle. Am I understanding that correctly? And, and what now the person that would know the answer to this would be Reese Harrison. He would know off the top of his head, I guarantee you. Uh, but uh, I'd hate to say what I've been told before because I don't know if it's true or not. Uh, what I've been told is that General Grand Council's uh, triangle was up, so Texas is down. That's what I've been told, you know, kind of like the thing uh, you have to stop having a Masonic meeting at midnight. You know, it's an old wise tale we've been told since you were uh, raised a Master Mason. Uh, so uh, we need to get with Reese and find out. So, guys, all I heard was that the Grand Master wants to phone a friend. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, let's, uh, good discussion. Let's move into our, uh, our, our, our meat and potatoes tonight. We have the Grand Master of the Grand Council of Royal Slate Masters with us tonight, most illustrious, uh, Don Paul Payton, our Grand Master and, and our personal friend. Uh, a little bit about our Grand Master. Uh, he will tell you that he is from God's country. Some will agree with him, some won't, but if you ask him, he's from God's country. So he was initiated, passed and raised at McKenzie Lodge in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, served as worshipful master there. And he may or may not elaborate on this here in a little bit, but he got to confer the degrees upon his father, which is a pretty awesome honor, if I should say so. I, I, I don't, I've not had that honor. I don't know many guys who have, but he got to confer the, Freemason, the degrees of Freemasonry on his own dad, and that's pretty awesome. Uh, he moved to uh, Weatherford, Texas, which is still not God's country, God's country is out east where they have pine trees. But anyway, moved to Weatherford, Texas. Uh, I think you mean mesquite. No, sir. We have pine trees. Yeah, everywhere. God's country is mesquite trees. Anyway. Emblems of immortality in East <laughs> Texas. Maybe Weatherford is God's country adjacent. <laughs> moved to Weatherford. Met Casey. Got married. Had a family. Uh, joined uh, uh Phoenix Lodge in Weatherford, Texas, and subsequently joined Phoenix Chapter Council and Commandry. He'll talk a little bit about that here in a little bit. He's a member of the Fort Worth Valley of the Scottish Rite. He is a member of a variety of uh, appendant uh, organizations that we're not going to go into. He's uh, above all that, he's our friend, he's our companion, and he's our brother. And he's our grandmaster. So, Don Paul Payton, good to see you. Good to, see, good to be saved. Should we stand and clap? Uh, no. Virtually. Or symbolically. Virtually. That's what we 
Okay, so we're going to start off with some personal questions for our grandmaster. We're going to throw it to Billy first. I'm still right. married. <laughs> so uh, on this, I know some of some of the answer of this, but since you can't travel to visit councils due to the the pandemic, how have you been spending your time? As we all on this conversation, uh, uh, as we all know, you know, I'll travel quite a bit each. Uh, almost uh, several times a week, going to different functions, whether it be chapter councils, commandery, Grand Lodge, uh, Blue Lodge functions. Uh, but now with this thing that's going on, I spend a lot of time on the phone talking to other people about other things, uh, Masonic situations, of course. Uh, um, spend a lot of time, uh, I told somebody the other day, I was talking to him on the phone and I says, well, what have you been doing? I said, well, my wife has me so busy doing so many things, uh, my place will look like Augusta National within the next couple of weeks if uh, she keeps this up. I've gone to the chiropractor three times in one week. So if that tells you what I've been doing. Uh, of course, uh, doing a lot of fishing, uh, using the old whopper plopper I got down there from Nederland, Texas. Over there at, uh, County Home and Outdoors. There you go. Got to throw that pun in there for them. <laughs> Just staying busy, doing podcasts, uh, working with the library museum. We've had a couple of meetings, you know, staying busy. All right. Thank you. Uh, so my, my next question is, uh, since you are from God's country, did you know Jimmy Wilson? Yes. And are there any stories that you can share with us uh, about him? Okay, so Jimmy Wilson, double L. Uh, whenever I joined McKenzie Lodge in 2000, uh, there was a guy who was the secretary of, in my EA. He was uh, another uh, important position in, the, in my master's degree, and I had him install me as master of McKenzie Lodge in 2003. He was a past master of Floyd Data Lodge. His name was Bob Vickers. And he had a lifetime teaching certificate. Um, he ran around with Jimmy quite a bit. You know, being from Floyd Data, he ran the, Bob ran the co-op there for you know, 20, 30 years. And so uh, got to meet him, meet him through those things. Plus, Jimmy was in the lumber business. And my family's from Turkey and they owned a lumber store there in Turkey. So he knew a lot of my uh, family members through that aspect. Uh, of course, the biggest thing, and I've said it before, uh, I belonged to a member, I was a member of Kitty Quay Lodge, 1248, that met in downtown Kitty Quay, Texas, which is in Briscoe County. So you got Turkey, Kitty Quay, which is where you can go into the Caprock Park and see the buffalo and all that good stuff. But downtown, uh, we used to meet, and there was about, whenever we consolidated in the Matador, there was 13 members-ish. Uh, most of us were from uh, Turkey area, and uh, it was it was those meetings in those lodges and those situations, as Jim being in East Texas, those small lodges, and you have these group of guys, and it, it, it wasn't based on quantity. It was based on the quality in those lodges and Kitty Quay Lodge is what I use as an example because when you went there and we had a dinner upstairs of course in the old building downtown there was probably five six guys there maybe seven tops but the discussions and the talks you had was better than any of the other lodges discussion and talks with 60 guys there was just a, it's a different feel and it's hard to explain and, um, but when you went into there, like I said, there were six, seven guys, but when Jimmy came to lodge, he brought the old Floyd Ada mafia or <laughs> the Floyd Ada guys. And there'd be 50 people in there, you know, cause Jimmy was that kind of guy. And, uh, everybody looked up to him, especially in the Panhandle of Texas you, or statewide, everybody knew who Jimmy was. And it's, uh, you know, I always ask the question, you know, how did a guy, like Jimmy Wilson from Floyd A to Texas and Furman Benson from Flomont, 
how did these guys get to become grand master of Masons in Texas when there was, you know, so many members, uh, you have Houston, Dallas, you know, huge metropolitan areas. How did these guys make that big of an impression and a mark in the Masons of Texas living in a town of less than a thousand people? I mean, that's a big thing. You, that's a big stick to carry right there. But Jimmy always walked around and he had those cards that they hand out with the past Grand Masters, you know, that list the year they served. And he, he'd hand it to you and say, hey, I'm the, la I'm the oldest one right here. <laughs> but uh, even Jim, Chance, Chance, I don't know if you, were, you remember Jimmy. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, in that Grand Lodge, he would be they he'd come in there and he was on that walker and he was getting it going down. There. <laughs> he, would, he would talk to anybody and he just had that persona of, you know, it, it didn't matter who you were. He he just uh, he was a very important guy. And I wish uh, Masons in Texas that didn't know who Jimmy was or what he did for Masons in Texas, especially the Panhandle. Um, would learn more of the things he did and how uh, it, and I said it earlier, how did a guy from Floyd A to Texas become Grand Master of Masons in Texas? Yeah. What do you think, Jim? Uh, it's all personality. I had the opportunity to meet him a couple of times at Grand Lodge, didn't know him, didn't get a chance to know him, just met him but he had a magnetic personality. And like you said, he would talk to anyone to make you feel like you were his friend. Uh, and that's how people from the far reaches of our state gain notoriety. It's, it's, not, it's not because they're doing something better than somebody else. It's because they're the, type of per they're the type of people or type of person that men like us look to and respect immediately because of the way they treated us. You know, uh, Jim, you're right. And I was talking to, um, I believe it was Reese the other day, and we were talking about Jimmy and, you know, Reese thinks of, of the world of Jimmy, uh, known him for a long time. And uh, there was something said that Jimmy never lost an election that he ran for. And that shows a lot. for To have that kind of pull, you know, for Grand Commandry, Grand Chapter, Grand Council, Grand Lodge, uh, national body lines, I mean, he did it all. Kind of like Sam P. Cochran. He was he was that guy I admired. Did a lot of things nationally. Yeah, DP, you'll like this. I held my very first Commandery School of Instruction in Lubbock, Texas, uh, in 2014. And Jimmy, uh, he's in pretty good shape still then, and he came. Uh, down from Florida to down to Lubbock, Texas, to hear what the Grand Sentinel had to say. <laughs> and I didn't know hardly anything, honestly. Uh, but it, Jimmy did this uh, almost every Masonic meeting I ever went to with him. And, of course, he was always afforded the opportunity to speak um, at everything. I, I don't remember going to something and him not getting to speak. So. He got up and he never told the same thing twice. It was always something unique and special about the day. I don't remember the words that he spoke, but I remember the feeling that I got from the words that he spoke. And that has lasted all these years. And I'll never forget that. And I'll never forget Jimmy Wilson and the, the stature of a man that he was in our fraternity. Not only in Floyd Ada, not only in Texas, but throughout the world. You know, Chance, it's, it's funny you say that. And I mentioned David DeBrell here just a few moments ago. Mm -hmm. But uh, I had David DeBrell told me something very similar one time. Uh, he and I were doing a funeral service uh, for a friend of ours. And David looked at me, and I mean, I'm just a guy from East Texas, and here's past Grand Master David DeBrell. He looks at me and says, No one's going to remember what you say but they're going to remember how you make them feel while this is going on. And that yeah, stuck yeah. with me uh, personally. And it's funny to hear you say those same words about Jimmy Wilson, because I, I agree. Yeah. And uh, dad to Brill, because he was a DMLA advisor for me. He was on the international Supreme council, just like Bart from uh, our last episode. Uh, he, he told me the exact same thing one time. 
uh, when I was still in Demolay, and it was, I mean, spot on, word for word, exactly the same. And so that's a cool shared experience. Different times for both of us, but that, same man, same awesome person. Yeah, David, David didn't talk a whole lot, but when he talked, it made sense. Kind of like John Wayne. <laughs> well, well, no, you can't compare David Abreu to John Wayne because David Abreu was soft spoken and you had to listen to him and you were, he's like your granddad. Right. John Wayne, you just didn't want to get hit in the head with a pistol butt. So you listened to him. <laughs> well, actually, All right. I, I did want to go back to that though. And it's, uh, in, it sounds like one of the keys to making a lasting impression in Masonic leadership is how you make other people, how you make other people feel. Uh, and that means everything with that is your legacy. Uh, because listening to the stories, I, I unfortunately, I, I came to Texas Masonry too late to uh, know Jimmy Wilson. But I do remember the first time I met David DeBrell. And it was the very first Texas Lodge of Research meeting I went to. I listened to the papers in, in the morning. Uh, then we went to lunch. And I grabbed my lunch. And I sat down at the table. and uh, you know, I, I had no idea who he was, and he came and he sat down, and, and his, his lovely wife joined him, and we had a great conversation for the entire meeting. He never really mentioned, you know, hey, I'm a past grandmaster. Uh, it was just all personal, small talk, um, very, you know, very casual, um, but one that that lasts with you. And I remember being very surprised when the Texas Lodge of Research reconvened. And they announced everybody who was there. And he stood up and, and he was recognized as past grand master. And it's like you never would have known just sitting and, and talking with him over lunch. All right, Chance, you're up. All right, our next question, BP. When you moved to Parker County, what made you join Phoenix Lodge to affiliate with? Uh, <laughs> when I moved to Parker County, let's see. That was about 03. When I moved here, uh, I believe it was June of '03. <clears throat> of course, uh, I had just gone out, was fixing. I just uh, let me think here. Golly, I moved to Parker County to Weatherford in '03, and so I was fixing to go out as master of my lodge in McK at McKenzie Lodge in Lubbock. Moved to Weatherford, uh, so I was. Uh, very active always ever since I've been raised since I was 21. And so I uh, looked up uh, a couple of lodges in the area and uh, found Phoenix. It was here in Weatherford, uh, went there, uh, visited a couple of times, liked the guys. They had a floor school every Tuesday. They had a hot meal, still do as of today. Uh, besides not right now, of course, but, they have a hot meal cooked every Thursday. They'll either have a, a, a called meeting on that Thursday or whatever uh, for school if they want to. Uh, just a more active lodge than what I was accustomed to. And then probably one of the most active lodges in this area for sure is Phoenix. And uh, got in, met some of the guys, you know, uh, and been an active member of Phoenix Lodge since uh, 03. All right, Grandmaster, you and I uh, crossed paths many years ago. We knew who each other were for many years, but uh, you were making yourself available for the Grand Council line, and I was making myself available for the Committee on Work for the Grand Lodge. And that year, we traveled a lot together and really got to know each other. And I think it's fair to say that we've become not just Masonic brothers or companions, but we've developed a true friendship. Uh, you guys may not know, if you listeners, that uh, our grandmaster and I—we, I bet we, I bet we talk on the phone twice a day. Don Paul, what do you think? We talk quite a bit, quite a bit. Of course, uh, I do more of the listening while you do more of the talking. I want to let that slide. I answer more of your questions than anything else. Anyway, uh, all seriousness, uh, we talked about Jimmy Wilson. David Brell was mentioned. I've heard Reese Harrison's name was mentioned. Uh, not famous people, but looking back on your Masonic career, who would you say was your biggest mentor that you had a personal relationship with 
uh, that that got you to where you are today. And I, I don't want to limit that to the York Rite chapter and council. Uh, open that to the lodge. Uh, and I want to hear about a person who touched your life, Masonic. Oh, man. Well, Jim, you know I'm not an <clears throat> emotional person at all, uh, especially when I talk about uh, Masonic. Her name is Casey. <laughs> um, you know, and I'm not, I'm not the kind of guy that, that, that talked. It's all, I always asking questions to other people. So I don't get put on the spot like a grand council or something like that installation, as you remember sitting right behind me. Um, hands down. Do you mean whenever I had to remind you what your wife's name was? I, I don't recall that situation. Uh, it happened. <laughs> um, verified hands down tj jones hands down uh, when i was initiated into mckenzie lodge in 2000 uh, they read my petition it just happened to be their state of meeting on june 15th uh my grandfather was a mason he was a member of yellow house 841 and uh, the I'll just tell you a quick story of how I joined McKenzie and met this guy. Uh, I knew I wanted to be a mace. My grandfather wore a ring, that kind of story. And uh, so I started looking online, uh, dial up basically, AOL.com. I remember them days. And uh, was seeing if they had a website. Uh, McKenzie Lodge had a website. And so I tried to call Yellow House. And I got an answering machine thing and left a message. Well, a couple of days went by. And so I got online and got the phone number off of McKenzie Lodge. And the guy answered the phone. His name was uh, Jack Morrison. He was the secretary of McKenzie Lodge at that point in time. And uh, he says, hey, come on down. This is where we're at off of uh, Avenue Q. So I go there. I don't know anybody in there. Not one person. Not one guy. I showed up at the state of meeting. Everybody's super nice. Ray Copeland, who uh, was master of McKenzie Lodge that year, um, Billy Stafford, Sergeant, any guy. There's tons of great guys there. And so uh, they all get up and says, well, we're going to go inside this room. And they all put on an apron. And I'm thinking, man, what are these guys doing, right? So – I, uh, the guys that signed my petition, of course, my grandfather was one of them. Uh, Bob Clements was one of them. Of course, everybody knows Bob. Uh, and uh, Dan Redman. Bob, Dan Redman, and my uh, grandfather were all members of Yellow House 841. So they read my petition, investigation committee. I get a phone call from the ex-captain of the police force in Lubbock who passed away several years ago, who, who was mayor, was very active in the Scottish Rite in Lubbock. Um, um, oh, my gosh. Past Master McKenzie Lodge. Anyways, I, I get a call from the captain of the police, uh, retired captain, and uh, says, hey, I need to meet with you. Uh, I'm on an investigation committee for the lodge. Meet me at my house. So he gives me his address on this day, and I drive over to his house, go in there, and he opens the door. And he says, go ahead and have a room in my study. <laughs> and so I go into his library, and it's him and another cop and a guy named Bill O'Neill, who's a ex-firefighter uh, for San Antonio. They're on investigation committee. Uh, then I get a phone call, be here at McKenzie Lodge, July. I do my uh, entered apprentice degree. Like I said, I didn't know anybody in there still. My grandfather was there. And after my EA degree, we're out there shaking hands, talking, and this guy pulls me off to the side and says, I'm TJ Jones. I'm going to be your instructor. And we've got a lot of things to go over. Be at my house at 6 o'clock tomorrow. Pick me up and we'll drive to the lodge and study. Didn't know this guy, never seen him. I'm thinking, who is this? What kind of situation am I in? So TJ lived, oh, on the other side of the street, down pretty close to my house. So I go pick him up. He walks out there, gets in the truck. Still don't know the guy. Really, I met him for a 
10 minutes maybe, the night before, gets on the truck and he says, drive me to the lodge. So we're going to the lodge. So we study going to the lodge. We get to the lodge, we study some more, and we study back, back and forth, and uh, learn this. We became really, really good friends. And uh, I learned the work, and uh, if you look at my history, uh, initiated in July, uh, raised August the 20th. So I was gun ho stayed, stayed busy. And at that point in time, Vernon Burke was the grandmaster in 2000. And he had this thing that if you had a certificate by that point in time, they would read your name at Grand Lodge uh, you know, during the session. I said, well, hell, why not? So uh, I studied the work, studied the work. And that year I conferred the outdoor degree that they have yearly there in, uh, outside of Lubbock and Slayton which was pretty cool. There was tons of people there. Here I was a 21 year old guy, just been raised a master Mason and uh, confirmed degrees, given lectures, man. I mean, I was, uh, I was, I was very, very active. Of course, at that point in time, I was not married yet. Uh, but TJ Jones, uh, if it wasn't for TJ, I wouldn't be where I am today. I wouldn't have accomplished anything. TJ taught more guys in McKenzie Lodge than uh, shake a stick at. That he by far is the man. Thank you, Grandmaster. A lot of our viewers or listeners may not realize that uh, you're a, a certificate holder in the Grand Lodge. You got a certificate in the Grand Chapter and Council, and as of this year, you are the district instructor for Masonic District Number 65, which happens to be in, in my region. And I'm proud to have you as a district instructor. Hey, that's that's good to be working for you, Jim. Thanks for having me. So uh, let's talk about the the York Ride, the chapter of the Council of Commandery. So whenever I talk about your your brief biography a few moments ago, I mentioned that you were a member of what was then Weatherford Chapter Council of Commandery. So a couple questions: uh, What made you decide to join the York Ride bodies? Uh, what bodies have you joined and what offices have you held? Whoa. Uh, of course, uh, back in the day, back in 2000, whenever I joined, you had the guys there from the Scottish Rite and the York Rite there in the shrine, you know, uh, hey, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? So I decided at that point in time, I was just going to take it easy, soak in the Blue Lodge, and then uh, in 03, uh, it would have been the first of 03, end of 02, I believe. I got interested and I decided I wanted to join the York Rite, which had met in the big uh, building downtown where 840, uh, Yellow House 841 met. And the York Rite had this huge room in there. So my dad and myself, uh, we petitioned the York Rite, went in. Bob Clemens, uh, Tom Heyer, who was a former committee on work member for the Grand Lodge from Hereford. He conferred my order of the temple. Um, Shannon Kelts, Bob Murder. I mean, there's any of the guys in Lubbock. But mostly the, the York Rat in Lubbock was based on uh, 841 Yellow House, for sure. Most of those members that were active at that point in time uh, were members of Yellow House. Uh, went there, like I said, a short time I become a member, didn't hold an office in, in Lubbock, uh, York Rite Bodies, moved to Weatherford and uh, joined, got a, affiliated with Weatherford Chapter and Council, um, which was in a bad situation at that point in time uh, because they lost their charter <laughs> the year after, I believe, oh, 2004, the year uh, James Roy Elliott was uh, Grand High Priest. Moving into our subject questions for you tonight, off of the personal questions. This one is a, a hybrid. It's part personal and part subject question. So what made you want to be the Grand Master of the Grand Council of Royal and Select Masters? Well, I, I enjoy Grand Chapter Grand Council sessions. It's a different situation than going to Grand Lodge. The, it's, it's a different feeling. If, you, if you've never attended a Grand Chapter Grand Council session, 
it's a completely different feeling than attending a gray lot session. It's more close knit, I guess you would say, because there's not as many people. There's not 3000 people there, but, uh, you see, it's a different feeling. Plus, uh, I was district deputy for, uh, Tim Laverne in 2013 with Chance Chapman, uh, Justin Bauer, Chance. There was a bunch of us, of course. Uh, yeah, there sure were. Uh, that was the year Paul Warren died, and then Tim jumped up and uh, assumed the position. Uh, but that's when I really got to meet and know uh, Jim Manley. Jim Manley, uh, for sure. Uh, he was Grand Master of the Grand Council. You know, Larry Canada passed away, you know, not too long after being installed as Grand Master. So Jim presided mostly, you know, filled in for his year and presided at his session and then was installed Grand Master for his year. And uh, Jim Manley, uh, seeing him, meeting him, uh, traveling with him throughout the state, going to this, going to that. Uh, that really got me interested and wanted to get active again uh, in the York, right? Especially, I like traveling. I like confirmed working in degrees, festivals, so forth. And that's why I wanted to do it. And to make a difference. Uh, I, I have a, a bunch of ideas that I wanted to, that I thought was a good idea. And I contacted, you know, people whenever I thought about making myself available and, uh, run it by them. They says, I think you should do it. So I wanted to do it more than anything in the world. Uh, if you remember, Jim, uh, when I was elected, uh, principal conductor of the work, we were standing beside each other and, uh, man, I got emotional. And, uh, as I think somebody told me, if, if you didn't get emotional, you didn't want it bad enough. So that's the way I look at it. That, that, that emotional response is a trend. Yeah, different yeah i'm uh, i'm the kind of guy i don't talk about myself or present myself it's not i i i it's always we we can do this i like to rally the troops and get something done uh and so when the, the tables are turned and it's back on deep uh dawn hall i'm not used to that and so i think that's where the emotional side gets into well, I can tell you this. I am proud of you. Thank you. I appreciate that. One of the new initiatives for your year is the Council Grading Competition. How has COVID-19 impacted the implementation of this program? And are there any plans to get it back on track once councils reopen? Yes. Come hell or high water, we're going to get this thing done. Uh, <laughs> I had this idea. Uh, of doing the grading competition. So many times we go into a council meeting that's either declared open or no ritual opening at all. Uh, it's just kind of gaveled and the business, well, it's the same business we did in the chapter. And just go on. Uh, there, there's really no point. And so our opening and closing for the council for sure is probably some of the most beautiful work hands down. And I think uh, to get people more uh, active in our councils, if you're installed in an office, you need to hold up to your end of the bargain. here. And it's not hard. The ritual parts just, uh, I think, plus I like a little competition. I'm that kind of guy. If we're going to go fishing, we're going to have a bet on who, who catches the biggest fish. That's, that's my kind of deal. And uh, have a little fun with it. Plus, doing the grading gives councils an opportunity to win a little bit of money in a, in a fun competition instead of it being, you know, a different scenario. Uh, but I hope, I'm, I'm working on thinking about it, how we can implement it. Because we had, what we were going to do is take the two, uh, gradings throughout the year have an average, but now some of them did, did not get graded. So the idea I'm thinking about doing is just take uh, the best score out of either or uh, gradings and go with that.
just an idea for right now, but yes, we're going to get it done. All right. I'm not, I'm, I'm not the guy to kick the can down the road and pass it off to somebody else. We're going to do something. All right. Um, excellent. Thank you. A, a follow-up question to this, you know, as this was unforeseen, uh, is there anything about being grandmaster that took you by surprise? Uh, and are there any tasks or challenges that you didn't expect? Ooh, I mean, that's a big, that's a tough question, Billy. Uh, I guess other than a pandemic, you know. Like, yeah, other than a pandemic, right here. no, not really. I kind of expected it because you you know by the time you take, you're installed in that position, what well, what's expected of you and, and what you got it. Like your, um, all your, in, in the Grand Council, Grand Chapter Grand Council, all your pins, your uh, ties, um, cufflinks, all that stuff, you pay for. There's not a budget line item that says, hey, this is for your merchandise, you know, you pay for that. That can, that's, so you, you got you know that before uh, you you've got three three to four years to get ready to do that save up the money to pay for all these things uh, so that's kind of the biggest challenge I guess you would say you know uh, if uh, my opinion all right thank you grandma <clears throat> okay uh, the next question is what is something that you have done as grandmaster that you Hope is carried on for the years to come. Okay, well, it's pretty simple. Uh, the grading, for sure. Uh, and that could be fine tuned. This is the first year we've ever done anything like this. And, you know, as uh, all programs, when a new program is started, you need, it needs to be fine tuned. Uh, the Grandmaster Fun Jewel, for sure. Um, I'd love to see that continued. Uh, in different variations, uh, and, you know, uh, I don't know the last time the Grand Council raised almost $20,000 for the Texas Masonic Retirement Center, but it's been a long time if it has ever happened, uh, just by the sale of these jewels. And uh, I'd like to continue that. Um, that would be something that I would like to see continued, you know, in different variations, for sure. How, however, and uh, and it, anyways, that's what yeah. I'm babbling now, but yes, yeah. for sure. Has there been anything you wish you would have done differently so far as Grand Master, not including the COVID-19 issues? Differently. Well, Chance, you know, uh, I'm not one to say that I'm always correct. And if I mess up, hey, I'm the guy that will say, hey, I messed up. Let's fix it. And uh, as of right now, I can't think of one thing I would change. All right. All right. So, most illustrious, you mentioned the Grand Master's Fun Jewel. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about it and how the proceeds are, are going to be used? Okay, sure. So the Grandmaster's Fun Jewel, which is what uh, I have on my jacket right here, all the funds, uh, the primary charity of the Grand Council is the Texas Masonic Retirement Center. It's in our Constitution. So what we've come up with this year is this fine jewel that you can purchase, and all the proceeds from the sale of this jewel will go to support the No Mason Left Behind program at the Texas Masonic Retirement Center. And as of to date, uh, we're, I'd have to check it, but you know, around somewhere around 18, 17, 18, 20,000 ballpark. Uh, I'm sold out of jewels right now, but they should, they're coming. Uh, Cause I've got a lot of orders I need to fill right now, but, uh, and I, I'm ready to get back on the road uh to sell these jewels and 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 spread the word amongst the companions and uh present that big check at uh, the grand banquet for sure so are you actually going to get like a giant check like they have on game shows and and such because yeah. i totally think you should yes i'm gonna offer that 
to the internet committee chairman to design and have printed. Uh, but speaking of that, uh, but wait, there's more. Uh, there are 27 limited edition jewels and uh, they have 27 jewels on this particular, I'm, I'm not wearing one, but it has 27 jewel stones, purple stones in it. There's, and they're numbered on the back. Yes, chance and y'all have one, yes. Uh, all are sold except one. Uh, jewel number one will be auctioned off at the Grand Banquet uh, in December uh, for, to the highest bidder. And I've already heard of the opening bids of being over $1,000 right now. So uh, being in the, in the Western industry, the cows horse business, uh, I like a good horse auction. And so we're going to have an auction and see how much money we can raise. So you're saying bring your checkbook and or your PayPal information. PayPal information check or uh, as I like to do, cash. All right, thank you, Grandmaster. All right, Grandmaster. Uh, so with the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen proclamations from Grandmaster Underwood of the Grand Lodge of Texas. Uh, we've seen proclamations from the Sovereign Grand Inspector General of the Scottish Rite in Texas, uh, uh, illustrious Michael Wiggins, uh, which prohibit the use of Zoom platforms like we're using tonight or other teleconferencing software for ritual-based meetings that deal with things that aren't written. Uh, the, the council, the Grand Council, is a little bit different in that our rituals are published in plain text. Uh, what are your thoughts on the restrictions from the Grand Lodge and from the Scottish Rite? And what is your advice for the Companions of Texas uh, regarding uh, teleconferencing software for cryptic ritual practice? Uh, at this point in time, I completely uh, want to follow and agree with Grandmaster's Underwood uh, proclamation uh, about the ritual via computer. Um, I think as of today, May the 6th, I believe is what today is. I think sooner than later, we're going to get back to chapters, councils, lodges, commanderies, uh, going back to the buildings. But I, I don't think we need to have ritual practice or meetings via Zoom or any computer-based uh, teleconference software. If we start doing stuff like that, there's no reason to have a building uh, for people to have fellowship and go and travel and, and, and see one another. Um, I just, I don't think that's the right thing to do at this point in time uh, because sooner than later, we're going to get back in there doing what we like to do. Thank you, Grant Master. Uh, last question is that uh, what does the future hold for Don Paul Payton? What does the future hold for Don Paul Payton? Well, I'm going to stay active in all aspects of masonry, Grand Lodge. Uh, chapter, council, commandery, and help make a difference uh, with the companions and the masons and Sir Knights of Texas and help uh, pave the way for things that we need to accomplish together. Thank you, Grandmaster. A lot of our viewers may not realize that you were elected this past Grand Lodge session to a uh, the vacancy on the board of directors for the Grand Lodge Library Museum in Waco. Uh, would you like to let any of our viewers know what's going on with the building, what's going on with the Grand Lodge Library Museum? Sure, the Library Museum Board of Directors are very busy. Uh, we have a lot of meetings and the most important thing is that building right there, the edifice of Mason, masonry in Texas. When you think of masonry in Texas, you think of the Grand Lodge building, at least I do. Um, as a pivotal location, uh, everybody knows uh, that the Mason in Texas where it's at. Uh, and if you've ever been in there, you see the amazing artifacts that's in that building. Uh, 
uh, past Grandmaster Jewels, all the pictures, uh, the Sam Houston information, the uh, items. The library has a, is a great library. Um, we need to make decisions now to safeguard the future of that building. Thank you, Grandmaster. All right, guys, that pretty much wraps up our podcast as far as the subject matter content. Uh, I'm going to pitch it over to Billy Hamilton for the quote of the week. Billy? All right, thank you, Jim. So the quote of the week comes from James Wilson. That's not the same Jimmy Wilson that we talked about earlier in this podcast, but one of the original justices of the United States Supreme Court. Uh, and here's what he said was, let a state be considered as subordinate to the people, but let everything else be subordinate to the state. Uh, and he actually said that in Chisholm versus Georgia uh, in 1793. Thank you, Billy. Uh, Grandmaster Payton, any closing comments or final thoughts? Ready to get out there and travel down the road some more with you guys and see the companions and masons of Texas and get busy. We got a lot to do. And as uh, my old buddy Jerry Reed, you say, we got a long way to go and a short time to get there. Thank you, Grandmaster. Uh, Chance Chapman, closing thoughts or final words? I just want to thank Grandmaster Payton for all that he's done for our Grand Council and his leadership this year. Uh, we've been working since he got elected. He asked me to be on his planning team, and we've been working at this literally since that day uh, of his election and installation as. Uh, the right illustrious grand principal conductor of the work. Uh, we talk every day, DP. I appreciate everything that you do. You're one of the closest people in my life, and uh, just want to thank you publicly for everything. Well, thanks, man. I'm not. <clears throat> Go ahead and cry a little bit. <laughs> thank All you, right. Chance. Uh, Billy Hamilton, closing comments. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for uh, for being our guest here. Uh, I'm sure next week, actually, you'll go back to being one of the hosts, and uh, we'll be on the other side of the microphone once again. Uh, I I am a late addition to your planning team, but I have to say, uh, since joining, it's been a whirlwind of activity. So uh, I, I'm really excited about uh, this year, um, resuming once we get back into council um, with implementing some of the programs that you've come up with. And uh, I really look forward to, uh, to finishing out this year under your leadership and uh, seeing where it leaves the, the state of Texas and our companions uh, for your successor. Thank you, Billy. So uh, uh, last thing I would like to say, by the time this, this podcast airs, one of uh, the illustrious grand chaplain of the grand council of Royal Slate masters of texas will be a married man and uh on behalf of the Royal Slate masters of texas i would like to congratulate uh illustrious jim jimmy royce <laughs> rumsey and afton on their marriage so congratulations to you two kids. I'm sure you'll have a heck of a good time. So the bigger question is, Jim, where are y'all going on uh, your honeymoon? Because you travel the world all the time anyway. So how do you, if you got to pick one place to go for your honeymoon and you're Jim Rumsey, where do you go? Well, you clearly go somewhere amazing. And that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> congratulations. So you're not even going to tell us where you're going? Or are y'all going later on? We're going to go later in the year. It's uh, too crazy. Most of the world, we actually, we checked uh, m numerous times, and most of the world is shut down to travel. So uh, we, got, we got a voucher, and we're going to make it an amazing trip later in the year. Well, Jim, I've got a recommendation for you and your wife, and you need to let her watch this because uh, I can honestly tell you I know a location that's very special and has zero. We are not going to Turkey, Texas. Listen, listen, we're not to going say. to Turkey, listen, Texas. Listen to me. Has zero cases of COVID-19. And that is in Turkey, Texas. <laughs> you can, I can get you a room at the Hotel Turkey, bed and breakfast, the oldest operating bed and breakfast in the state of Texas, continuously operating. 
and uh, I know some people there and uh, can get you the uh, star suite is what we would call it. And y'all could have a hell of a good time. Thank you, Grandmaster. And companions, you can email us at chat at yorkwrighttexas.com. That's C-H-A-T at yorkwrighttexas.com. Until next time, this is your Texas York Right Podcast signing off.